This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. How to approach the P3 case study. This presentation is based on an article that was published in the August 2010 edition of Student Accountant magazine. To benefit fully from the presentation, you should download the question that's used. That's question one from the June 2008 P3 exam. It's called Ultrophone. You can download it from the link shown at the bottom of the screen. After each examination, the examiner publishes a report where it describes how students have gone on the exam. Some themes keep repeating in these reports. With regard to case study scenarios, the examiner complains over and over again that candidates have a problem applying theoretical knowledge. There are very few marks available for describing a model, for example describing Porter's five competitive forces. At this level, you're supposed to recognise the presence and effect of the five forces, or at least those which are described, so that you can help to move the problem forward. It is vital to use a 15 minute reading time at the start of the examination to get to know the case study well. One of the best ways of making it very effective is to read the question, or at least requirement A, before reading the case study. This warns you, it puts you on notice about what you should be looking out for when you read the case study. Is it a question to do with a takeover? opening abroad, stiff competition from large international companies. Reading the requirement will help you to read the case study with much more meaning. As you go through the case study in your reading time, remember you are free to annotate and to mark it. So, for example, if you are asked to do a pastel analysis, use P. E, S, and so on, to write on the case study where relevant factors have been described. There is no irrelevant information in the case study scenarios. By the time you see a case study scenario in the examination, you can be sure it's gone through a very long and thorough editing process. Nothing is there by accident. You must concentrate on linking the scenario information to the questions that are asked by the examiner and, where appropriate, and it nearly always is appropriate, link that information to appropriate models. Models are there to help you. They're better than starting with a blank sheet of paper. They provide some analysis, some structure, that will help you progress the problem. Part A of the question asks candidates to carry out an analysis of the competitive position of Autophone. As is suggested here, most candidates used Porter's five forces. And that's fine, there was lots of information in the scenario which you could use within that framework. Some candidates used Pastel and some SWOT. And that's fine too. What isn't fine is to repeat over and over again using different models the same piece of information. That doesn't get you anywhere. If you have identified, say, a new piece of technology using Pastel, then there's no point in identifying it again using, for example, the substitute part of the Porter's Five Forces. There is very little to be gained by using different models to make the same points. If you are going to use different models, make sure you're using each model to bring out something new. OK, let's have a look at models. Though so many, students often get confused as to which one to use. This is especially the case if the examiner says use a model or models of your choice. If the requirement is to do an environmental scan or an environmental analysis, then probably what's required is Pastel. This is the large, the 
the macro environment, the politics, economic, the social, the technological, the ecological and the legal environment in which all companies operate. Remember, you don't have to talk about all of these. A scenario may well be silent about social and technological factors, but say quite a lot about ecological and legal, or economic. Make use of the model as a checklist. If the requirement is to discuss the competitive position, or in fact just the position of the company, then Porter's five forces can be very important. It's very difficult to write a scenario without reference to competitors or customers or suppliers. Additionally, there may well be reference to the potential of new entrants. All the pestle matters are external to the company, and essentially all the matters in the Porter's Five Forces are matters external to the company, but which nevertheless influence the company's position. Internally, we have the resources of the company. Often they can be remembered by the M words. Material, manufacturing, manpower, management, money. Additionally, there are some other internal type resources, like know-how and brand strength. Stakeholders can be both internal and external. An example of an internal stakeholder would be a shareholder or an employee. An external stakeholder could be a member of the local community who is perhaps going to be inconvenienced by the company's operations. Some stakeholders bridge the gap. Customers and suppliers are contractually related to the company. Remember Mendeloff's matrix telling you the amount of power and the likelihood that people will exercise their power. Of course, SWOT is a model, and sometimes it is specifically required by the examiner. Apart from that, its great property is that it will always work. It allows you to put all external factors into either opportunities or threats, and all internal factors into either strengths or weaknesses. However, if you're asked to use a model or models, Although SWOT will work, and if you can't think of anything else, use that, it is perhaps a little weak. It might be better to start off using Pastel, and to feed economic factors, for example, into the threat box. Similarly, when you're looking internally at the company, and you see perhaps that they're short of money or finance, that could go into the weakness box. Rearranging SWOT into the Tau's matrix can be particularly useful. If we have an opportunity, and with that we can match a strength, then that's great. We can use that strength to make the best of the opportunity. If there's an opportunity but we're weak, then before we can make use of that opportunity, we have to make it good. So there might be an opportunity to take over a competitor, but with no money. Therefore, the first thing to do might be to raise finance. If this is a threat and we have a strength with which we can fight it, again, that's a good position. However, what we don't want to do is to have to fight a threat with a weakness. We have to find some other way of surviving. So here are the steps you should take. First, read the requirements, or at least part A, to alert you to what the question is about. Use your 15 minutes to read and reread the question, annotating, underlining and highlighting as you go. Try not to panic here. 15 minutes is loads of time to allow you to become familiar with the scenario. Look very carefully at any financial or quantitative data. This has always been provided in a case study. Financial information and strategic planning are inseparable. Finally, plan your answer. Make sure you address the requirements, particularly two-part requirements, such as identify and appraise. Pay attention to the marks available. This will guide you as to how much time you should be spending on each part. Remember to get full value from this presentation. You should have downloaded the question. Look at the requirements to part A. And it says, using an appropriate model or models, 
analyze the competitive environment of Autophone's retail shops division. The word environment suggests pastel might be useful. The word competitive suggests Porter's Five Forces might be useful. So we should be looking out for all of those component parts as we go through reading and rereading. You have 15 minutes now to do that. Go slowly. Take your time. Think. Annotate. Here's how we've annotated two paragraphs near the start of the question. If you download the article from Student Accountant magazine, you'll see the full annotations all over the scenario. First it says here that we seem to have a 30-year supply contract. That means that the suppliers are locked into us ready for 30 years. That implies very low supplier pressure and puts us in quite a strong position. Further on down it says, however, speaking in 2003, the managing director of one of the networks suggested that Autophone had got away with incredible profit margins when they signed their deals in 1990. What we're saying uh, about this, really, is that the suppliers, the networks, will have learned their lesson. That everyone was new to the game and allowed Autophone to have this very profitable business. It's very unlikely that suppliers will be so naive again. So any other person who's coming into the business will certainly have a much tougher time. So effectively we have a barrier to entry. The government says that four current providers are all there's going to be until 2020. So in other words, there's going to be no new entrants coming in here. And again, we're in quite a strong position. No new entrants to networks anyway. Autophone currently has 415 shops around the country. That seems a lot. Think how many towns there are likely to be, and you've got 415 shops there. They're obviously operating at a very large scale, and you can certainly argue that operating at a large scale and the economies of scale, the marketing power that you have, will act as a barrier to entry to other people coming in. Down here it says it is usual for Autophone to sign 50-year shop leases in return for a low initial annual rental. That means that their shops are very secure, there's very low supplier pressure, we're not going to be thrown out. Uh, the downside is we might be locked in. If we wanted to get rid of these shops, it could be really quite difficult offloading a lot of them. And it'll have a long period of the leases still to go. So some good news, some bad news there perhaps, uh, depending what we're trying to address. In 2005, with it being rated by consumers as one of the top 20 brands, well, that's good news, isn't it? Uh, what sort of things does a good brand do for us? Well, of course, it's a resource. But it's a resource because a, a good brand means low buyer pressure and it can mean customer loyalty as well. That people keep coming back to us, that we're trusted and that perhaps we don't have to trade on price quite so much. That may not be the case in uh, autophones, but we have to see about that later. Remember, you can download the full article from Student Accountant magazine to see how the other parts of the scenario have been annotated. Now let's look at some of the financial data. Table 1 shows how relatively unimportant both AF Direct and AF Unsure are to the group total. 45 and 14 compared to the 340 or the 399 is so far negligible. There's some quite interesting material in the age profiles of customers. You'll see that the Autophone Retail Shops division the majority of customers there are in the 41 to 60 uh, age range. These people will presumably uh, begin not coming to shops quite so often in the future. And it could be said that as this population ages, the autophone retail shops divisions are going to become less successful. Look however at the younger people and how they are interested in AF Direct. Here, the 15 to 25, 26 to 40 form the majority of customers. And presumably, as time passes, AF Direct will become more important 
and the retail shops will become less important. Now let's look at what Table 2 shows us. And it shows between 2003 and 2004 there was growth of about 5%. However, when we get to 2007 and 2006, the growth rate uh, is almost negligible. It's about 0.7% there. So the market is about static, and the only way for the firm to get bigger is to gain market share from others. So rivalry will be very intense there. Autophone itself has managed to increase its market share from 2003 to 2007 and has enjoyed growth of 2% from 0607, so between here and here. Table 2 also shows us that the five competitors, Autophone, NetAG, Point9Net, PhoneLine, NetConnects, are of about equal size. So we have relatively few powerful competitors. This is what's known as an oligopoly. The characteristics of that is that if any one of them makes price reductions, the other ones have to follow if they're not going to lose market share. And this can be quite an unstable setup. And finally, here's step four. This sets out the plan for answering the question, which was to examine and investigate the competitive environment in which Autophones was operating. From our annotations and our reading, we should have identified the following. First, potential entrants. And there's a very low threat here. Providers already in the market, they are very large. Other entrants will be given a poor deal because the mobile phone companies have learned from their past mistakes. Suppliers. Here a supplier is a mobile phone company and they have entered into 30 year contracts with us so very little bargaining power with them. Rivalry. This is of the providers who are all about equal sizes and that makes it quite difficult. Technology allows rivalry over the internet so it may be increasing. Buyers. Unfortunately despite the claim that Autophone is giving impartial advice there seems to be little customer loyalty. There seem to be few switching costs, for example. And this could make it quite difficult for Autophone in the future. Substitutes? Well, at the moment, none is known for the phone function. Although, if we get on to looking at it, when we're looking at the shops, obviously the internet is a potential substitute there. And the market conditions? Well, there's low growth, which will mean high competition. New technology means that there's going to be internet competition. We could add bits about legal, the government doesn't want any more mobile phone companies that will restrict new companies coming into the market. Overall, the position doesn't look that secure. And now we'll look at part B. Step 1. What are the requirements? Autophone CEO is anxious to develop a rational and well-argued case for retaining the retail shops division. Write a briefing paper for the CEO to submit to the Strategy Planning Committee explaining why the Retail Shops Division should continue to form a key part of Autophone's future strategy. A couple of things to note here. First, it is a briefing paper. To all intents and purposes, that's the same as a memorandum. You need to head it up, though. Who it's from, who it's going to, when it was written, what it's about, and so on. However, what you really need to watch in this question is if we've been asked to say why the shops should stay open, we are not asked to discuss if they should stay open. In many ways, we're giving entirely biased advice here. We're looking for the good reasons why they should stay open. We're not really looking on the downside as to why they should close, which in many ways is actually the easier case to argue. OK, moving on. Step 2 means read the scenario, but we've already done that. However, you'll probably need to go through it again pretty quickly, looking for reasons to keep the retail shops open, and a way of refuting the two directors' paper. The financial data is extremely useful in this argument. Just look at the evidence we have that supports the argument to keep the shops open. The retail shops contribute 85% of the total turnover, and 88% of mobile phone sales. The retail shops are still profitable. Return on capital employed even now is 5%, although it has declined. The gross profit percentage, 26%, doesn't look too bad. 
The net profit percentage is 3%, down over four years from 12%. It, it, it's all pointing to division in trouble. But we have to accentuate the positive here. That's what the question wants us to do. So here's the plan of our answer. This would be included in our briefing paper. We could change the approach in the shops to push more profitable phones so that profits increase. But of course, there is a conflict here with the mission of the company. The shops are on long leases, so there could be substantial exit costs. It's all very well abandoning a shop, but if you still have to keep paying the rent, you're not much better off, probably. The retail shops are still profitable, and they are by far the largest part of the business. What would be left, they went. The brand is based on the reputation of the shops, and this may be linked to the success of the internet and insurance businesses. Potentially, if you did away with the shops, the other parts of the business could be damaged. Finally, part C. The Autophone Retail Shops Division faces problems in remaining faithful to the original business idea of offering impartial advice to customers and developing an appropriate reward system for its staff. Evaluate what changes the Autophone Retail Sales Division should consider making to both its business idea and its reward system. Evaluate implies you have to make a judgment on the changes that might be necessary. You might also be able to say which changes might be difficult and which easier. By now you'll be fairly familiar with the question. The relevant material is in the fifth paragraph and the three paragraphs between tables two and three. In this part of the question, the financial data seems to hold little relevance for us. Here's our answer plan. Remember this question had two parts. We had to consider whether we could stick with the original business idea of offering impartial advice. And we also had to consider the reward scheme for the employees of the company. We have to make sure our answer addresses both of these because there will be marks available for both sections. First of all, the business idea. It might, in fact, no longer be viable. Note the success of the city branch. And you have to realise that things change, nothing stays still. And whereas when the company was set up it was the only place to get impartial advice, now there may be many places on the internet or even magazines and greater customer knowledge. As businesses mature, there's usually more competition. That competition is often very keen and inventive. And the old ways of achieving profits may simply not apply anymore. Everything changes. Now on to the reward scheme. And there has to be recognition in that scheme of repair work done to phones bought from AF Direct. Why are we repairing, for no charge, phones bought by what in a way is a rival division. There's likely to be great resentment there. Costs but no revenue basically. There was an attempt at management by objective but that didn't really work and there's no point trying it again without changing the reward scheme. And deep down there's a kind of conflict or inconsistency. Rewards are closely based on profit. Managers are supposed to be entrepreneurial but the city branch manager was reprimanded. If their central idea is to offer independent and impartial advice, remuneration should be linked to that, not to profits. The way to earn profits is to push for profitable phones. The way to give impartial advice is, perhaps, to advise people to buy a less profitable phone. They really have to make things consistent.